Okay, so the general idea is that um, stars can actually form shock waves in gases. We've seen this already because we've seen that exploding stars can produce shock waves that cause gas to be heated to the X-ray. So it uh, emits in the X-ray range. We talked about that last time. Um, but this shock wave has another effect, which is that it can actually cause um, the pressure to increase in a local area in a molecular cloud. And as we know, an increase in pressure in a molecular cloud can lead to star formation. So um, these, these high pressure regions can be formed in various ways. It could be exploding stars, but it doesn't have to be that violent. It can simply be from the strong winds or even the radiation from young and bright stars. So that can basically just compress the cold regions of a cloud, increase their density, and then boom, star formation. So this is an example where a young star is creating a, a bow shock, so a bow-shaped shock wave in the gas around it. And so let me ask you this. Um, if I have multiple generations of stars that are um, causing each other to form um, in waves due to those shock waves, then where would you expect to find the youngest stars? All right, yeah, I'm seeing most votes for A, that the youngest stars would be found nearest to the molecular cloud. Um, I mean, maybe that's sort of obvious because that's where these protostars are being formed. Um, but if we add the rest of the labels to this propagating star formation model, then we see that the oldest group is farthest away from the molecular cloud. Um, you might also notice that they are, you know, for they're farther apart than the young cluster. And also there's more red stars in this old cluster than there are in this young cluster. That's because some of the blue stars have already died. So the blue stars form quickly, they die quickly, and it leaves mostly red stars behind. This comes back to that idea that we talked about where the brightest stars in our sky are blue stars because they're the ones that are you know, luminous enough to shine from great distances. So we see lots of them because we're seeing deep into space in many directions to those blue stars. But the red stars are the more common ones in our own solar neighborhoods because in general, they're the more common type of star. And that's simply because they outlive all the other stars. All right, so this propagating star formation model means that um, we could you know, try to look in space for a structure like this, where a molecular cloud is, uh, you know, has successive uh, star clusters farther and farther away from it, where the ones farthest away are the oldest. Um, I think I have a homework problem that's along these lines. All right, um, we can actually look at you know, specific stellar nurseries and see if we see evidence of any of this process. Um, so this is the star cluster and star forming region Westerland 2. Again, we've got a molecular cloud at the left, a star cluster kind of in the middle, and the star cluster, its radiation has carved out a kind of notch in the molecular cloud. So you might expect then to find star forming in the regions, you know, close to the molecular cloud, and you would expect to find um, younger star clusters in the close vicinity and older star clusters as you move away. So that's something that you could look for. Um, okay, so the, this image that we're looking at, I just want to point out that it's actually a mosaic image. And so this is in two different wavelength ranges that have been put together. So it's a visible um, image of the nebula, and you can see these dense globules here that are kind of forming in those finger fashions like we saw in the Eagle Nebula, and there's newly forming stars that are within there. If we look in the infrared, that's where we see this dense young star cluster. So these mosaic images are pretty common when you're looking at star forming areas, so it, it pays to pay attention to which wavelength ranges you're looking in uh, because they give you different info. Uh, 